Hey, it's Cat, and I'm back because what once was will never be again when Daenerys gets done breaking the will. And so, in this episode today, we are going to use history, mythology, and a little astrology to divine some mysteries of the Game of Thrones. And this time, we're going to talk about what is the story behind the prophecy of the dragon must have three heads. And if you caught our other video about the story behind the story, then you know that Mr. Martin chose this particular time in history, the War of the Roses, because it literally was a song of ice and fire. It was the marriage of yin and yang. It was the breaking of the will and the dawning of a new age. But before the princess that was promised could take the throne and usher in the dawn of a new age, there had to be a dragon with three heads. In our last video, we talked about how the War of the Roses had pretty much wiped out most of the major contenders for the throne, leaving the way for peripheral claimants such as Henry Tudor, who picked up the dragon banner in Wells and swept across the field of Bosworth to victory, with a little help from his friends. It was left up to the women to make the peace. That was Margaret Beaufort, Elizabeth Woodville, and Cecily Neville, who arranged the marriage of Henry Tudor and Elizabeth of York the Winter King and the Summer Queen, the marriage of yin and yang. What came next might tell us a little bit about where our story, The Game of Thrones or A Song of Ice and Fire, is going. Arguably, Henry Tudor, a.k.a. Jon Snow in our story, was the first head of the three heads of the dragon. The other two heads were his descendants, Henry VIII and Bloody Queen Mary. These three changed the history of England forever. Just like in our story of Game of Thrones, a large part of the nobility had been wiped out. When Henry Tudor came to the throne, he had an empty royal treasury and it was the deepest, darkest part of the time period known as a mini ice age. Long years of war, famine, and the plague known as the Black Death, represented in our story by Grayscale, had wiped out about a third of the population. In the story of Game of Thrones, winter has just arrived. And the Night's King, along with his Walking Dead, representing the long winter as well as the famine, is just about ready to sweep across the wall and take out Westeros. In history, by this time, the people were simply exhausted. The kingdom was a disaster, and it was vulnerable to any outside enemy. But as usual, the nobility wasn't quite done fighting. And so Henry Tudor's first job as the first head of the dragon was to squash the power of the nobility. First, he had himself crowned king before he called a parliament, showing that he did not require the accession of the nobles to wear the crown. At his first parliament, he had himself retroactively declared king the day before the Battle of Bosworth so that anybody who had fought against him in that battle were automatically traitors whose titles, lands, and money were forfeit to the king. Fortunately for them, Henry had seen enough of war and understood exactly how the blood feud continued with the killing of certain nobles and then their children and or their cousins or brothers coming after them. And so he instituted a policy where those who would swear fealty to him now would have their property and titles reinstated to them. He levied a livery and maintenance tax. Now the livery was the colors and or the badges of the houses that the men served. And typically, these were the men the nobles drew from to create their armies. He made it financially unsustainable to sustain anything that was close to an army. He then set up his own small army, as well as a taxation and collection process that allowed him to collect money without having to call Parliament every time he needed it. And then, when he did call Parliament, he had himself awarded tonnage and poundage. And this was essentially a tax on any imports. By the time he was done, the monarchy was secure and it was solvent. He concluded the war with France as well as obtaining a hefty settlement and then concluded several other crises that included also receiving a ton of money. He was essentially billionaire by the time he was done. While Henry was kicking down the nobles, his wife Elizabeth of York was busy being the smiling, approachable face of the monarchy. She was the people's princess of her time. She handed out alms, provided for charities, orphanages, hospitals, and generally helped create the base of power amongst the common people for the monarchy. 
Thus, those few rebellions that they did face were generally small and short-lived. Unfortunately, after only 18 years of marriage, their first son, Prince Arthur, died at the age of 15, and then shortly thereafter, Elizabeth of York passed away in childbirth, and this is when Henry VII became the true and real Winter King. When Henry passed only a few short six years later, his son, Henry VIII, came to the throne, and at that time, he was held as the Prince of Spring. After about 20 years of relatively peaceful rule, Henry became the second head of the dragon. His attempt to alleviate himself of his wife, Catherine of Aragon, led him to separate England from the church in Rome, and then tear down most of their monasteries, confiscate most of their wealth, and set up a new church in England that was under the control of the state. As he became more paranoid, he further depreciated the ranks and the power of the nobility. His son, Edward VI, who took his throne thereafter, was no dragon. And it was his daughter, Mary, better known as Bloody Queen Mary, who was the third head of the dragon, who purified the church by blood and by fire, finalizing that knell in the coffin that separated England from the Church of Rome forever. By the time... Princess Elizabeth came to the throne as Elizabeth I. The people were cheering, as the Spanish ambassador implied, little unseemly within only a few days of the Queen's death. But there were a few that were still holding their breath. Were they going to get the princess that was promised, or were they going to get another dragon? Fortunately for them, Elizabeth had been a keen observer and an excellent student. And she had some excellent advisors that advised caution, caution, and more caution. Elizabeth never married. She refused to give any man power over her person, property, or kingdom. She treated her people as her children. She believed it was her right and her responsibility to ensure their general welfare. She kept England out of general warfare. However, her privateers with letters of mark that preyed on the Spanish galleons almost led England into a major war. If it had not been for the divine wind wrecking the Spanish Armada, they might have suffered some reversals. It was the golden age of England, the age of exploration, the age of Shakespeare, the Renaissance, and thereafter it was the age of the constitutional monarchy and the age of enlightenment. It was literally the dawning of a new age. In our story of A Game of Thrones, Mr. Martin doesn't necessarily go in a linear fashion in depicting his characters who represent these three dragons. Certainly, Tommen appears to be Edward VI, the helpless, hapless heir to the throne, who really had no time to rule on his own. And Cersei appears to have taken on the role of Bloody Queen Mary. The only one we haven't seen for sure yet is Henry VIII, although that might have been Joffrey as an amalgamation with his terrible behavior towards women. We might see him yet in the guise of Euron Greyjoy, who in the books right now is in the process of taking many salt wives, looking for his one true rock wife. In the books, from the release chapters of The Winds of Winter, as far as we can tell, none of Euron J Greyjoy's salt wives survive. So what will happen to Jon Snow and Daenerys Targaryen? who are Henry Tudor and Elizabeth of York in our story. Well, like their counterparts, they're likely to fade off into history, obscured by the acts of all of those who came after them. Daenerys may die in childbirth, as did Elizabeth of York. And Jon Snow? I expect he'll become the King of Winter. <laughs>